Kom. Welcome everybody to the session Emerging Optical Networking Technologies. Uh, before we start, I have a few things of housekeeping to do. You already know, switch off everything except your brain. This is over. This evening there will be both sessions, a quarter of an hour after the end of this session. For those of you who are hungry, there will be sausages served outside. Very important, don't forget to fill out the evaluation forms or online forms before you eat the sausages, before you forget everything. And this brings us to the first speak today. It's Klaus Grobe from ATFA. He's speaking about emerging 40 gigabit technology, 40 and 100. OK, um, thank you, Mr. Kugler. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am happy to be here again and to give okay, an update on 40 gig and possibly an outlook on 100 gigabit. And when I am speaking about 40 gig and 100 gig, I, I am speaking about optical transport only. That's because Adva is, a, is an optical transport company. Okay, here's the outlook. Um, I will give a quick recap on 40 gig problems and solutions, most of which has been told last year. Um, then I will show some slides on the particular combination of 40 gig and maybe possibly 100 gig per second with RODEMS, because our understanding is that RODEMS is something that most of you are interested in. And I will present two or three slides on products. Um, OK, this is where we are today, um, the <laughs> National Networking Challenge. This here is the uh, aggregate internet traffic. And as you can see, it can only be coped with by increasing per channel bandwidth. And, and still, the gap between these at every given time, of course, has to be closed by duplication, that is, by, by, by WDM, wavelength multiplexing, and by using multiple, multiple fibers, etc. But nonetheless, although we have WDM fiber bundles, etc., everywhere, um, per channel bit rates have to increase, and this is where we are today. We, we have to use 40 gig more or less now, and uh, possibly in, in three, four, five years from now, we will have to use 100 gigabit per second per channel as a transport bit rate, which is quite a challenge. And this is why. Um, because unfortunately, things are not getting any easier with higher bit rates. These are some examples. Um, with the linear distortion effects, the sensitivity of our optical receivers is getting worse by 6 dB when getting from 10 gig to 40 gig when everything else is the same. That means same modulation format, same FEC, etc. Um, chromatic dispersion is getting worse by a factor of 16. Not a big problem because chromatic dispersion can be compensated. Polarization mode dispersion is getting worse by a factor of approximately 4. And this can get the main problem. Then we have on top some nonlinear effects. They at least are not getting better. And hmm, all of this is getting even worse with 100 gig. These were the numbers for 40 gig as compared to 10 gig. And um, as an example, if we compare 10 gig to 100 gig, chromatic dispersion is getting worse by a factor of 100. This simply means our chromatic dispersion compensators must getting better or tighter or more exact by a factor of 100. As I already indicated, polarization mode dispersion may get the main problem. Polarization mode dispersion, while it is an effect that uh, although we are using single mode fibers, they are not really single mode fibers, they are dual mode fibers. 
and we can identify the, the two modes with the um, states of polarization. SOP is the principal states of polarization, and unfortunately, there are two in a standard single mode fiber and, and also in, in dispersion shifted fibers. And unfortunately, also, these two states, states of polarization can travel at different velocities, which simply produces um, a dispersion effect and hence bit errors. Polarization mode dispersion is a, a stochastic effect, so it's, it's pretty tricky to compensate it. It is possible, however, the compensators are not 100% reliable. They have certain downtimes, which cannot be avoided. And alternatives, especially for, say, 100 gigabit per second transport bit rates to, to compensation, would include higher order, that is, complex modulation schemes or possibly polarization, domain multiplexing, and combinations of all of this. I want to go into some more detail regarding uh, polarization mode dispersion. This is the result from a fiber audit on more than 2,000 installed fiber lines done in Brazil in, in earlier this decade on brand new fibers. You, here you can see the, the deployment dates. And there is no old G655 fibers whatsoever. It is new fibers as you can get them today. And what this chart indicates or shows is that a significant amount of fibers in the range of 20 to 25 percent exceeds all standards. All the relevant ITUST standards say polarization mode dispersion mustn't be higher than 0.5 or even 0.2 picoseconds per square root of, of kilometer, whatever this dimension says. It is the dimension of the uh, polarization mode dispersion parameter. So 20 to 25 percent of all installed fibers, even new fibers, are exceeding standards. And, and they can reach values of one, two, three picoseconds per square root of link distance, which means they are not usable for 40 or even 100 gig. Not at all. That is the problem. 20 to 25 percent. OK, so now what has to be done, because all the other effects grew as well, um, to, to transport 40 gig and 100 gig, short recap as well, um, everything that's possible, that is simply the answer. So we, we have to use high gain forward error correction. We have to use advanced low noise amplifiers, dispersion management on the fiber lines, additional tunable dispersion compensators at the receive ends, here's um, a schematic of one based on an array waveguide filter. We have to use um, exotic <laughs> modulation schemes, not the old well-known NRZ scheme anymore. Things like CSRZ, which stands for carrier suppressed return to zero, or um, differential quaternary phase shift keying, which are schemes that are well known in, in, in digital communications, or maybe duo binary or polarization domain multiplexing. And in the end, we will end up with a combination of all of these, just to be able to transport 40 gig or maybe even 100 gig on fiber plant that has been designed for, for 10 gig. So uh, one message clearly is it will not get significantly cheaper than 4 by 10 gig. Next part of the recap, what, uh, what's, what is uh, CSRZ, dual binary, DPSK, et cetera? It is modulation schemes. And modulation schemes can be described um, using the, the symbol planes. Here we have a signal that is transported. Uh, this is the signal that is being sent into the fiber by the laser. And the signal is the sum of symbols. A with the index K are the symbols, and Q is the, the, the pulse shape that is being used. It's a cosine roll-off or whatever uh, we are using. And now, the symbols A uh, in, in, in binary transmission can only, in um, unipolar binary transmission, can only have 
uh, the states 0 and 1. That is what is used today. However, there is no need to only use zeros and ones. We could, for example, uh, use minus ones and plus ones. That would be DPSK. Or we could use um, four symbol states, um, like indicated here. That is DQPSK. We could use a ternary modulation scheme, including zero. That is duo binary, and also CSRZ. And we can do much more things, for example, uh, 16 QAM. Um, so today, what is available in the 40 gig arena is, is, uh, comes, is, is here, these, these schemes. And possibly, maybe 16 QAM is a contender for, for 100 gigabit per second. Who knows? Next slide. Uh, Comparison of, of, of the main uh, modulation schemes that are used today, I only I, I highlighted some some building blocks here, and and the red building blocks is those that would not be used for standard 10 gig. So this shall only indicate things are getting more complex. They are getting well expensive, and this is not the guarantee that it will work. Um, Okay, I will not go into details here. If, if, if you are interested, uh, visit me on my booth. We have one opposite the, the entry of room A. Um, okay, 40 gig as it seems today is not the end of the story. So today, as you all know, we have the, the discussion, um, will it be 40 gig ethernet or 100 gig ethernet? And, and the answer seems to be it'll be 100 gigabit ethernet that will be standardized. Last thing I heard is maybe possibly both is getting standardized. Here's some further thoughts on 40 gig versus 100 gig. Um, it is not officially decided yet. M many things indicate it will be 100 gig. OK. If it is 100 gig, 40 gig lacks mass market. That means there is no big application for 40 gig anymore. Why is that? Because it's also commonly agreed that over the next um, eight to 10 years or so, the, the synchronous sonnet SDH transport hierarchy that is in use worldwide will, will be replaced by, by, by packet-oriented transport technology. And 40 gig would have been the next, or is the next logical step in, in sonnet SDH. But since sonnet SDH will die out, and, 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 and if then Ethernet goes to 100 gig, there is no mass application for 40 gig anymore. It will be a niche technology. The other thing is, serial 100 gig transport has already been demonstrated already years ago, if you want. And today it seems that serial 111 gig might be the contender who will be standardized. 111, that is 100 gig plus overhead plus line coding. And it is uh, commonly expected that the uh, mass adoption will take place around 2010, 2012 or so. Next one. Some further arguments, um, 40 gig Ethernet versus 100 gig Ethernet. I will not go into too much of detail here. I want to focus on the highlighted. Um, statements. It seems standardization for Ethernet will take place at least another three years, which is the argument for 100 gig. Because if in three or four years from now, 40 gig should be standardized, it will be too little bandwidth. It has to be 100 gig then. So the main argument seems to be uh, 100 gig gives high performance improvement. Um, and Consequently, 40 gig uh, gives too little uh, performance improvement. And, and all the rest can more or less be solved. For example, I don't know, the, the, the 400 watts that a, a single 100 gig Ethernet optical line driver will consume of electrical power. It seems to be pretty much, yes, but compared to uh, a 10 gig copper driver for 100 meters that consumes 50 watts as well. So where's the point? Next one, um, yeah, this is a, a very particular problem. 
uh, you all want to go into very high bit rates, so you, you are considering 40 gig, maybe 40 gig demonstrators now, and, and, and to, 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 to um, play a little bit with very high speed uh, technology and to go then to 100 gig maybe in three, four, five years from now. But you also, at least part of you, want to have RODEMS. RODEMS is reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexer. It's sort of an optical cross connect. It is all optical. It provides, well, sort of optical switching, at least reconfigurability of the transport network. And there are some issues with combining today's 40 gig with today's RODEMs. That's why. Hmm. Here's an overview on, on possible RODEM architectures. We could uh, put a, a switch matrix, a MEMS matrix or so, in between two filters, the, the MOX and DMOX filters. Uh, early RODEMs were based on wavelength blockers. WB stands for wavelength blockers. Mm. Today, much uh, development is in the area of wavelength selective switches that use free space optics and, again, MEMS, possibly. But uh, many of today's commercially available RODEMs are based on this technology, IPLC, which stands for Integrated Planar Light Wave Circuitry. That is obviously an integrated technology. Integration is OK, because I can integrate certain optics and electronics features. It is compact. It is reliable. Uh, it is available, and hence it is a product. And um, here is uh, some more detail on an IPLC RODEM. The, the IPLC chip itself integrates some filters, not all. These are only the filters that are used for the add path. They're, they are not the filters for the drop path. These will be dedicated filters. Uh, the chip also integrates lots of monitoring taps and diodes, which is good. And this is monitoring for both single channels where available, that is here in the add path and here between the filters, and also monitoring for the optical multiplex sections. And this is relevant. I, I, I can monitor all signals. And then I have, well, I, of course, I have the switches. Without the switches, it wouldn't be a, a reconfigurable uh, optical multiplexer. But then I have these, VOAs, which, uh, which stands for variable optical attenuators. And uh, the, the VOAs, together with the monitoring and together with uh, some intelligence, may, maybe possibly through a control plane, give me means for equalizing signals in a long transmission link. So this uh, piece of optics and electronics uh, is a reconfigurable ad drop multiplexer, but it, it is also a fast equalizer. And, that's the, and it is integrated, compact, reliable, as I just said, and that's why it is in use today. And uh, here, the filters. They are integrated. They are R8 waveguide grating filters. AWD, AWG stands for R8 waveguide grating, which is simply a certain uh, optical filter technology. And as such, it has a certain spectral characteristic. And that is relevant. We cannot change the spectral characteristic of AWGs. And now, it has been shown. In, in, in lab experiments, for example, in, in a recirculating loop like this one that, that, that takes a, a certain number of, of these RODEMs, including the AWG filters, and also takes a certain number of amplifiers, so in order to produce noise, etc. It has been shown that um, certain modulation schemes that are used for 40 gig today um, well, they, they, they can very friendly cooperate with the characteristic of AWGs, or they, they can destructively interfere with it. And, and here's an example that is very friendly. It is the duo binary modulation scheme. And, and shown here is the OSNR, which stands for Optical Signal to Noise Ratio, which is a relevant parameter. Uh, that is required at the receive end. So it is the required OSNR. And the lower the required as, uh, OSNR is, the better is the system. That is, the, the more 
tolerant against noise uh, and, and other uh, distortions it is. And, and what is shown here is the number of mux dmux, and I should say, it should say AWG mux dmux pairs, and hence it should say pairs of IPLC-based rodents uh, in, a, in a long link. And as you can see, the required OSNR decreases over the first, what is it, four, six, seven rodent pairs. That is, in a long link, say, of 1,000 kilometers or so, it is better to have six, seven, eight rodents uh, rather than not to have any at all, although they are um, putting in additional attenuation. This is the effect of, of both the equalization, but also the, the, the spectral shaping through the AWG filters. And obviously, dual binary is a modulation scheme that is, that is very compatible with the, with the spectral characteristics of AWGs. And unfortunately, this is not the case for example, with um, CSRZ, which is another scheme that is available today as a product. And this is also not true for DPSK. Both CSRZ and DPSK will have a penalty per rodem. That is the penalty per AWG. And the penalty is in the order of half a dB. That is, say, four pairs of rodems, including those at the end of the links. Will, will give you a penalty of 2 dB. Even more pairs will give even more penalty, and in the end, in a rather long link, with, with 8, 10 rodems, which can easily be necessary, uh, you have a penalty that makes the modulation scheme useless. And this is relevant. In long links with many rodems, certain modulation schemes that are available today are useless. And this is why, again, um, because the, the modulation schemes also have a certain spectral characteristic. And here, what is shown here is, is the spectral width of the, of, the certain, uh, of the various modulation schemes. And as you can see here, um, dual binary has a, a, a very narrow spectrum, and hence it is uh, so compatible with the AWG filters. Whereas on the other hand, for example, where is it? return to zero DPSK has quite a broad spectrum, hence it will suffer from penalties. Same for, for CSRZ. The only other scheme that is very uh, spec spectrally efficient uh, is DQPSK, which is a complex modulation scheme. So if you want to deploy combi a combination of rodems, IPLC-based rodems or AWG filters, and 40 gig today, um, it, it makes sense to combine uh, the rodems with dual binary transmission. And you have to be careful with DPSK. That, that's, that's the main message. Um, so here's the summary of what I just said. Um, and it, all what I mentioned so far is valid for the 100 gigahertz WDM grid that we are using today. In addition, we are not only considering, well, going to 40 gig or 100 gig, we are also considering, uh, madly enough, to go to 40 gigahertz WDM spacing, uh, which will again, of course, make things worse. Um, so, summary is, uh, yes, dual binary is compatible with rodems. It can be used as a modulation scheme for 10 gig NRZ overlay. So, it can be used as an overlay, as an upgrade, sorry, as an upgrade technology for today's systems. CSRZ, uh, well, can be used with, uh, uh, as an upgrade technology for existing systems, yes. And it's pretty, pretty resistant and tolerant against polarization mode dispersion, by the way. But be careful with rodems. One or two of them in the link, that's OK. That's a dB of penalty. That's nothing. But uh, um, six or eight rodems in the link, that's, that's four or five dB uh, penalty. And, and the system doesn't work anymore. Pretty much the same. Not exactly the same, but pretty much the same for DPSK. Uh, it would be different for DQPSK. And uh, well, big quotation uh, question mark, sorry big question marks 
400 gig. Uh, we simply do not know uh, what combinations of 100 gig with uh, certain rodents, that is certain filters, how they behave. And, and, and in particular, we do not know how, uh, what, what will be if, if 100 gig has to be combined with 50 gigahertz. Obviously, we have to, 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 to use uh, higher order modulation schemes like 16 quorum or something like that. But that's, that's future. I don't say it can't be solved. I, I, I'm only saying we don't know. Uh, last few slides, products. Um, well, first, an uh, first yeah, answer is yes, we have products. We have 40 gig products today. And these can be used to upgrade existing Adva links. So if there is an existing, well, it's called FSP3K then, link somewhere, there's very good chance that it can be upgraded to 40 gig. So uh, the 40 gig should run over existing filters, over existing amplifiers. It, uh, this existing DCF is dispersion compensating fibers. That is the chromatic dispersion compensators. So it should run over an optical link that exists. And it is also um, managed through the installed management system. And there are two flavors, either 40 gig transponders that give you a 40 gig stream or four by 10 gig mux ponders that do transport four channels of say 10 gigabit ethernet. And even better, um, they, the, the system has certain specifications. I will not go into every detail here. This simply say, says OSNR is pretty much the same than our metro slash regional 10 gig gear. Chromatic dispersion allowance is also pretty much the same. And then the, the consequence is if, toler uh, if PMD is low, then the system is compatible with existing links. If it's a bit higher, well, then hmm, use a PMD compensator. This is available. It gives you approximately the, 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 the tolerance of a 10 gig link. If, if PMD is even higher, well, then our 10 gig should have made problems. Um, possibly 40 gig will then not work anymore. And by the way, the, the allowance starts without PMD compensator starts, uh, is in the range of 3.5 picoseconds. And now compare this with the quality of the fiber. On a very good fiber, it'll be more than 1,000 kilometers. On a hmm, reasonably good fiber, it's a couple of hundreds of kilometers. And on a bad fiber, according to standards, it'll be 50 kilometers on a really bad fiber, worse than standards, it'll be close to nothing. Um, last slide. Our 40 gig reverence. Uh, we tested it, or we had it tested in the German Viola network. I'm, I assume you, you know what Viola is. If not, go and Google it. Uh, and Viola tested uh, a cascade of, of various uh, 40 gig systems, as you can see here. Um, also, the systems of Alcatel and Siemens, um, where Siemens, by the way, is our channel. And um, yes, the tests were successful. And as I said, you can Google it or maybe possibly ask uh, the, the Viola guys who are here as well. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you to the speaker. We have room for a few questions. Please wait for the microphone. Hi. You were talking about, sync, uh, about demodulating uh, QPSK and other advanced uh, modulations. Does that mean you have to actually synchronously demodulate the uh, light carrier? Um, I'm not absolutely sure whether or not I understood the question correctly. Can you, can you repeat it? Yeah, OK. Uh, you first start with NRZ, where you basically just amplitude modulating the, uh, the light. Correct. And then later on, you show us QPSK and other advanced modulation schemes. Does that mean that you're actually synchronously detecting the light wave and that you're mixing it down to lower you mean, frequencies? Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, in optics, it's, it's called co coherently, then. 
Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, in, both exist with the um, DPSK as it is used normally and as, as it was shown in the in the slide. This is a, a, an optical delay demodulator, and delay demodulators are demodulators for differential phase shift keying. A differential phase shift keying doesn't have to be demodulated synchronously. That's, that's, why we, that, that's why in most cases DPSK and not PSK is used. If PSK was used, you, you would have to, 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 to use a local oscillator. <laughs> that is a, 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 a phase-locked local laser. Um, same for DQPSK, exactly the same. The 90-degree phase shift for the, for the in-phase and quadrature is, is produced by, by a, a simple 3 dB coupler. OK, thank you. Further questions? I was just wondering whether your 40 gig solution fits into the 50 gigahertz spacing. Um, in fact, and I didn't mention that we have more than one solution. So we, have, we can offer more than one modulation scheme. And yes, the dual binary does. Dual binary uh, has a, a, a spectral efficiency which is close to one bit per second per hertz. And so these 40 gig, gigabit per second per hertz, uh, sorry, gigabit per second fit into 50 gigahertz. So dual binary does, CSRZ doesn't, and DPSK doesn't neither. It would be possible since, um, well, Uh, where is it? The the red curve here is CSRZ, and the, 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 there is some symmetry in the spectrum. You could theoretically truncate one sideband, and then it, it obviously fits into, into 50 gigahertz. On the other hand, if you truncate one sideband, you are losing at least 3 dB, which makes it, again, useless. So CSRZ wouldn't, wouldn't fit DPSK neither. Do binary does. More questions? Next speaker is John Paul Hemingway. He's a longtime uh, researcher in the area of uh, fibers and network design, currently working for Siena. Please go ahead. Thank you. Everyone hear me okay? I'm going to change gears a little bit from the uh, last presentation, which is very much focused on the, the physics and the optics and increasing speed, which is, of course, very important. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on the, the need for light paths um, I'll define a bit about what light paths are about and some of the control plane technology that's been deployed. Uh, if you were in the session in this room previous to this one, you'd have heard someone like Internet2, for example, talking about dynamic light path provisioning. So I'm going to talk about some of the control planes, both in a single domain, but also when you try and stitch multiple domains together. Um, so I'm going to review some of the work that's gone on, um, very good work in a number of institutions um, that have happened in that space. I'm then going to move on to see what uh, Sienna and other vendors are looking to do with the next direction of control planes. There's a couple of big contenders for SDH. Uh, I saw the figure in the last presentation for eight to 10 years for SDH. That, that, that figure varies from four years to 15 years, depending on who you believe, for SDH and Sonnet going out of the network. Um, but there are two serious contenders for the connection-based um, control plane requirements, one of which is OTN, the Optical Transport Network, or G709, as it's been called, and one is a new set of uh, Ethernet-based protocols, what I've termed connection-oriented Ethernet networking. And I think both of those are contenders for the requirements of um, optical control planes. So I'll very quickly restate what we're seeing as a set of requirements in research networks. So this should come as no surprise to you at all. Um, there's typically a few scarce resources, you know, radio telescopes or whatever else the, those very expensive and very powerful um, devices are. There's going to be some kind of data crunching or you know, data processing requirements. And there will be some data storage once you've got all that data together. 
but there's a multiple set of communities of interest who really need to get hold of this information. So at any one point you want to connect those communities of interest across a control plane domain, set up those light paths. Now those light paths really need to be guaranteed, they need to be deterministic, they want to be anything from you know, a few megabits up to 10, 10 gigabits and beyond as we heard in the last presentation. Ideally you want to schedule those. Sometimes you might want them for a day, a week, or maybe you'll leave them permanently, but you need that flexibility. Um, a key thing we're seeing from a lot of people is the, the, the low latency and low jitter of the uh, circuits that are required. So that's why we see that that's key to have a control plane to rapidly set those circuits up, collapse them down, and reset them up for other applications. Which is what my lovely animation says just here. Um, but last of all, and I, I heard in previous presentations, that people are realizing that high availability of networks is key. You know, gone are the days when there was the carrier network that needed you know, ultra-high reliability, and the RE networks would just do with what they needed. You know, the need is now then you're going to crunch a lot of data, you don't want to go and get that data again. You want to have a very high available network. Now the reality is that they're not all in one big domain. Typically you will work on global projects that need to connect to these data collection devices that go across one SDH domain. You may then have to hop across an MPLS domain and then hop back onto a SONIC domain to get from end to end. Now there's a lot of devices out there who can do this correlation between SDH and SONIC. But what I've drawn in the, the blue cross devices there, there's got to be some smarts that enable you to get between the two domains because different parts of the world have adopted different technologies. So what kind of technologies are out there? I got apologies for the very review nature of this particular slide, but we've got a WDM layer, which is pretty much taken as red for any you know, high bandwidth requirements on national and international networks. You then, for many years, have an SDH and SONIT sitting above that. Um, clearly that's driven for SDH services, but it's also driving IP over SDH um, or IP over Ethernet or IP over optical. You're starting to see the huge number of combinations that are actually being used in networking today. To further blur the boundaries, if you like, you're now seeing the SDH and SONIC networks actually having converged packet engines in those devices. So that the, the mixture of networks you're going to come across for a global, global light path is going to be quite substantial. But to class those into two rough categories, the, the bits on the left there I'd really call um, circuit switched. And that that's ter been termed for SDH and SONIT. It'll be termed for the OTN networks that I've mentioned before. So well, how do you characterize those? They're typically very deterministic. You've set up a guaranteed set of time slots on a SDH circuit. The bandwidth's guaranteed. You're not trying to share that bandwidth. And very high availability with restoration mechanisms, ultra-fast 50 milliseconds, those kind of characteristics. If I then look on the right-hand side, and this is where IP and MPLS has you know, been absolutely prevalent in core network in particular, what, do, what does that bring you? Well, obviously, you're getting some kind of packets multiplexing. You're getting some statistic gains, so you're getting some bandwidth efficiencies. You're typically having very granular bandwidth availability, you know, one, one megabit, two megabit, three megabits, as you need it. And therefore, you're getting bandwidth sharing on your infrastructure. So there's good and bad for both. I think I've heard the term, you know, SDH and SONIC is dead so many years now that I sort of get tired of hearing it. But every time we try and plan our products that we're going to take it out of the network, up comes another requirement needing it. And I mentioned before, circuit switch networks is, is a key one for having some of those qualities. I could have picked a few examples, but I wanted to just pick one, which uh, you know, some of our friends over at the uh, Ultra Science Net, USN, have been looking at. Um, this is a, a four node switch network using one of our switch products with parallel OC192 or STM64 equivalent links going all the way across the US. They are linking together the IP devices um, and as you see in the purple line there, what they also have is a parallel MPLS path. Now, what this gives is an excellent test bed to really see can you stitch together networks out of an MPLS section followed by an SDH section? Are there any differences in performance between MPLS and SDH? And I think that the benefit of having a SDH cross-connect or a SONIC cross-connect to do that is that you can loop around backwards and forwards using the cross-connect structure and I think they've looked at doing this sort of eight or so times across the US and back again to really stress just what's the performance of these, these characteristics. So they're putting on IP performance protocols on there to see, okay, what's my, I, my, my iPerf, what's my T, TCP performance to see what kind of the protocols are the best and can you support the same kind of performance with a mixture of TDM and MPLS. What they also used is something I'll come to later is that they use this, uh, some scripted using TL1 but scripted bandwidth reservation. So you didn't have to have people on site setting these things up. They wrote their own protocols to reserve the bandwidth and set up these cross-connects. 
If I look at some of the results here, and they did a, a great deal of results, and I think that you may have seen some of these before, but I, the one I wanted to, the, the couple I wanted to frag here is that they set, pretty much set up on the top here, they set up a, a gigabit Ethernet connection between these uh, Linux hosts going through a couple of uh, Ethernet switches here and then looping them across this four node core director network. And they'll loop in those back and then sometimes back, back, back again. What we saw here, they actually did a longest effective length of 34,000 miles. That's a huge transmission distance to put this over. And you see why it's such a good test bed to do this. I'm reliably informed that's about around the Earth once. So this is really testing the protocols as far as you're ever going to need to stretch them. And what they found in the results, and you can certainly can point you to the reference for this, is that there was almost zero performance degradation as you increase that loop length from back to back, just looping back here, up to these you know, 34,000 miles. So clearly, circuit switch networks still have a place to uh, offer these kind of services. I don't know if you're coming across InfiniBand very often. Obviously, it's linking together clusters of, um, of computers. It's also becoming of interest to the financial markets to shove huge amounts of data between these big trading centers. But they also looked today at an InfiniBand switch. And again, they looked at putting them through the, the SGH cross connects and looping them and looping them back. And even with InfiniBands, they found that going over 8,600 miles, the drop in throughput was almost negligible. It's like 7.5 gigabits down here, down to about 7.2 gigabits. So really, having this SDH and Sonic infrastructure, circuit switched infrastructure, has a place compared to trying to do this at the IP layer. So now I return to the multi-domain. So that's a single domain. That's a single domain of cross connects that all works fine together. What about when you need to put in a connection across multiple domains? So I've got a network A, B, and C here in the brown, green, and blue. Now, there are a number of ways you can get these devices to speak together. Um, the two leading contenders for those have been GMPLS through the IETF forum and ASON through the ITUT and latterly with extensions in the OIF forum. Now, the challenges with uh, some of these domains, and I'll point to GMPLS in particular, is that there's a set of commands that every single one of these nodes has to understand. So all of the signaling, all of the routing, you've got to get vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C to understand every single communication between those devices. In this kind of peer-to-peer -peer model, that starts to become pretty complex. And although we're all trying to adhere to the standards, that starts to in, uh, introduce um, interworking issues. So what we like about the approach that um, we've taken, and, and many others, is taking some concepts from the, the, the ASON um, side of things uh, with the OAF uh, extensions. What this allows is that you tend to sectionalize this overall big white fluffy cloud into a number of subdomains, each handled by a, a, an I and an I which is really the network-to-network the network, uh, interface within a, a certain vendor or within a certain domain. Now, what that allows is that each vendor can uh, implement the INI as they see fit. They can have it optimized. They can get the performance as absolutely critically key as possible. But then when you want to share across those domains, you recognize that there needs to be a, a subset of those commands. You then take the problem space from every single command and control down to just a subset. What you're really doing is you're making these look like black boxes. You can, ab you can uh, have an abstract view of this that can be either one node, just the gate, just the entrance and exit nodes, or slightly other uh, star-based mechanisms. But really, you can start to abstract those and really just exchange the information that you really need to. This makes interworking far, far easier and has been demonstrated in things like the OAF forum and will be, in fact, in September of this year with the next round of OAF demonstrations. So that's really why we like the uh, Ian and I and I and I approach to things. Clearly, when you have routing devices connecting over gigabit Ethernet, the uh, uni interface, something that actually go into the box and request bandwidth. Now, all these are pretty well understood and pretty well tested. And again, I'll point to something like the OAF as an excellent test bed to show this. Does this mean that ASON and GMPLS cannot work together? Absolutely does not. And there's some fantastic work being done, both within the industry, but also um, you know, within some of the, the research and education uh, institutions. And I point to the, the, the Dragon protocols that have been developed. Um, some of this work is very good. And basically, they recognize that, well, OK, we actually have a, a number of virtual nodes that we control. These can be just powerful PCs that essentially sit above the, each domain and say, I know all about this black box. I know all of its connections. I know all of its capacity. But I will represent that as a virtual node. So when I get a request from this Edge device, I'll request bandwidth from this virtual node. This virtual node can then talk down into this node and say, hey, CNI and I, I need a circuit from A to B, and I need to be this capacity, and I need it for this amount of time. So this kind of work that allows virtualized GMPLS to sit above a GSON-based network 
really does work and has been demonstrated by Dragon and again is part and parcel of these OAF demonstrations. That said, the standards are still maturing. Clearly, we'd like to have everything into working together, but it's a lot of hard work to make sure that everybody implements these in the right way. So the IF have done great work on looking at Ian and I, what version one. The Uni 2 is the first one that really lets you go on and give it Ethernet interface. Uni 1 was not allowing that, but Uni 2 is really adding Ethernet to the story, which is absolutely key for routers and switches requesting bandwidth from SDH cross-connects. That's just in progress. I think it's very close to being formalized, but there's still a few pieces need uh, ironing out before it comes fully ratified. But that will absolutely be tested in whatever beta format it needs to be in the September OIF demonstration. ITUT and IETF, so the, the drivers between ASON and the drivers between GMPLS, have both got a good set of standardized uh, protocols. What I will say is that the best thing that's happened is that all three of these parties are actually coming to work together. You know, people from Siena, people from Nortel, people from multiple bodies all sit on these um, panels and really make sure that all of these issues are ironed out. So if you buy a GMPLS-based network, it will work with something that's based on something else. It's trying to get commonality across there, across all vendors, across this space. Some extensions we'll point to, and I'm going to come to the second, is there are, there are works to uh, get MPLS and GMPLS to interwork. And there are pieces of work undertaking now, which I'm going to come to in a second, is looking at these next flavors of connection-oriented Ethernet. So having these extensions in place is where we're going to get these things standardized. So that's really w where things are today, and they're pretty well understood. Uh, there's some guys with a test bed out in one of the, uh, the stands here that can show you this kind of network in the, the, the MUP bed um, control plane. What I want to talk about now is what do we see as the future direction? So SDH and Sonnet is pretty well understood. Control planes are there. We can see GMPLS working with ASON control planes, with GMPLS virtualized overlays. Those kind of things are pretty well understood. For first say, where are we seeing the demand for it? And I'm going to give you the answer before I get to the, the end animation on this, but this is leading up to what we see OTN as a key SDH replacement protocol. So currently today, you've got IP, you've got all manner of services mapped over SDH rings. Pretty prevalent, you know, there's so many networks being built out of this, it's almost ubiquitous. But then, as the capacity grows, we have SDH that's built over wavelength. So now you've got wavelength WGM products pretty much being deployed all around the world, even down to small access networks are still having WGM in the form of CWGM deployed in the, uh, the networks. Clearly, IP is the global language of the world. Um, MPLS is pretty much there for certain applications. And IP and MPLS build directly over SDH or build directly down to the optical layer. So again, something else that builds over the DWM layer. We now see Ethernet. You know, there's a lot of Ethernet switches out there. There's a couple of uh, good vendors of them out in the stands there. Ethernet as the delivery mechanism for IP is, again, something else that's been built over WGM networks. There's a bunch of other standards in there. You may or may not do data center connectivity, but things like SCON and Fiber Channel are two protocols that are used in linking data centers together to do large synchronous tape backup. And alien wavelengths is basically anything else, anything else that wants to be carried over the optical network. So all of these services are now being built over this common WDM platform. We like to call this a server with many clients on it, essentially. Problem is that that's now managed. There's now proprietary mechanisms to manage the analog capabilities of each of those networks. And what we and almost every other vendor now is buying into is the, the use of OTN. Now, OTN has been around for many years. Um, G709 is the ITU standard that uh, pretty much defines this. But really see that now OTN that sits underneath all of this is the layer that will give you the performance metrics, will give you this totally transparent mechanism to transport all of those protocols from SDH to Ethernet to Sonnet, whatever it needs to be. Now, the last piece of it. Um, is there's yet another layer appearing that says, well, yeah, SDH and Sonnet is pretty good. Relatively speaking, it's pretty costly. Um, now, MPLS is fantastic for a lot of applications, point to point to multipoint configurations. But what if we want something less complex? What if we want something that looks and feels like SDH, but is at a price point that we can get Ethernet ports at? You know, the Ethernet switches are typically uh, at a lower cost point than uh, MPLS or indeed SDH devices. So that's the drive between these connection-oriented Ethernet. Um, there's a couple of methods out there in the, in the industry. Um, they both kind of have approached it from the same degree. They are both trying to make Ethernet connection-based or transport-based. Transport the way it does that is disable some of the Ethernet features that make Ethernet an issue when scaling. 
Um, you know, if you have a huge Ethernet network with hundreds and thousands of tens of thousands of devices, things like rapid spanning tree really start to hit issues. I know operators have had to switch rapid spanning tree off because it wouldn't converge and wouldn't operate in their network. You also disable Mac learning, you disable broadcast unknown, all the things that can cause Ethernet, pure Ethernet, native Ethernet networks to not scale, you switch those things off and you make it look and feel like setting up a transport network. I mean, from my simplistic view, I see it, I don't know if you're aware of things like SNCP and SDH world, I look at, it, may, it looks and feels to me like SDH applied to the Ethernet layer. It's having like Ethernet cross connects is the way I look at it. So I'll come on to each one of those in a second. So going back to uh, OTN, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of OTN, but just in case you're not, it is a standardized in G709. Um, it defines a set of data rates that are just that little bit bigger than SDH and Sonnet. What that means is that you can multiplex now ODU 1, 2s, and 3s, which are 2.5, 10, and 40 gigabits. We mentioned 40 gig before. Most 40 gig systems have SDM 256 and OTU 3 support. So it's already standardized. It's already in use in, this, in the network today. Um, the good thing about it is that OTU 2 can also map 10 gigabit Ethernet LAN Fi directly into the OTU 2. So really, it's completely transparent. It has a payload, which is this gray area here which is big enough to contain all of your SDH and Sonnet, but it can also contain Ethernet. So now it's a protocol that can map both SDH and Ethernet, but then have the same kind of SDH-like headers that we've been using for many years in networks to give you the kind of available seconds, unavailable seconds, all those kind of good, good metrics that help you operate uh, and switch on networks. So OTN, we see, is this great transparent payload that has forward error correction built into it, but can work for both um, SDH, TDM, Sonnet, uh, and Ethernet. It actually uses uh, asynchronous mapping, which means you don't need to have synchronization in the network, which is something that you need to design in for TDM networks. Now, the good thing for us and many other vendors is that you've developed control planes to work at SDH. I've just showed you a diagram that if, you, if I put a, an SDH payload next to it, you put the OTN right beside it, there's a lot of similarities, down to the fact that there's actually a couple of bytes in there that can talk between these nodes and actually have OTN speaking across what we call the GCC0 um, communications byte. We had that in SDH, it was called DCC0, so you can see the similarities. What this means is that we have these networks that allow nodes to see each other, discover each other, and communicate to each other. Basically, we can replicate that using the GCC within OTN. So now you can see this network that can support SDH and Ethernet together. This can now use the same control plane, the ASUN control plane I mentioned before, and carry that just like SDH did, but now it can carry Ethernet and SDH in the same format. Um, the good thing is, again, is that you, the ports on this for Uni2 are actually incorporating G709 interface definitions as well. That's more just for the FEC basis, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. So I'm sure my software development guys will love me for saying this, but it seems straightforward to me, certainly, to adapt our SDH control plane to the OTN control plane, and I'm sure it's all just a matter of software. And they love me for saying that. Um, now, I mentioned these connection-oriented Ethernet implementations, and I certainly won't try and do a, 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 an education point on this because it, it, they could be a topic, a day-long topic on these, and I know there, there are in many bases. There's kind of two leaders there. Uh, one is PVVTE, defined by the uh, IEEE standard there, and one is MPLS-based, so it's TMPLS. So really, think of it as transport MPLS. They both, as I mentioned, trying to do the right same kind of thing. They are, to me, are both the simplistic view, both trying to make uh, packet-based switching for look and feel and be more simplistic, like transport-based switching. Now, the, there's no clear winner, and there are some uh, vendors on each side of the camp that really are pushing them very aggressively. Um, what I will say is that the, both have standards mentioned here. Um, ITU have got some pretty good TMPLS standards. What I will say is that there's a lot of paperwork being done until someone takes this and does something with it, that's when you find out, will this network really work? And really, I think the, the biggest uh, indication that one of these may, may work is that BT have selected the PVVTE in their uh, British Telecom's 21st century network as a technology they're going to put forward in their, their new network evolution. So to me, that's somebody who's going to take it and make it work. Otherwise, it will stop as a paper exercise. So very briefly on, on TMPLS, I know I'm going to run out of time within the next five minutes, Essentially, TMPLS is a, what they call a carrier-grade packet transport. It really is MPLS at the uh, transport layer. So it's operated by the transport equipment, the SDH equipment, not by the routers themselves. So again, it's, think of it as a simplified version of MPLS. For example, it uses bidirectional LSPs, not unidirectional. It doesn't allow LSP joins and, uh, joins and splits. 
just to keep it simple. Um, so that means you have to put some extra traffic engineering in, but it makes it simple. Where implicit networks can run into scaling issues, this is about let's take some of those complexities out and then take it down to the transport layer to make it simple and do what it needs to do at that layer. PWTE, on the other hand, doesn't really need a layer underneath it. It acts on the Ethernet layer itself. So this is really extensions of the provider backbone bridging, you know, pretty well understood parts of Ethernet. Uh, and it's been an extension to that to make it look and feel like transport level or connection level oriented. Uh, it has a lot of capabilities like Mac and Mac encapsulation, which gives you a huge address base. You start looking at a number of VLAN addresses to address something to. This gives you a you know, Mac in Mac is millions, you know, 16 million or more end user addresses can be implemented using this uh, technology. How is it different from the Ethernet? Well, it really says switches off some of those problematic parts of Ethernet and really says, well, it's going to be static based. It's going to use something like the OSS to drive down commands and say, OK, I'm going to set up these um, pipes through the network that I'll look at a VLAN. And if the VLAN has the right forwarding tables, it will get put into one of those pipes that goes right across the network. This does push some of the intelligence that was at the Ethernet layer up to the OSS layer. Now, for us, that's particularly uh, interesting because that's something we've been doing for many years using SDH in the control plane networks of uh, GSON. So we think PBBTE is a good candidate to have something that says, OK, if I want to connect across the network, I've switched off a lot of the things that learned about Ethernet networks, and I've implemented down at the, uh, <coughs> the Ethernet's kind of cross-connect layer. Then how about using some of the control plane techniques to learn about networks, to do connection emission networks, I can never get this right, get CAC control, I won't go into the acronyms there, but allow circuits to stop trying to pinch bandwidth from each other. You know, we've been doing this and cracking this problem for about 10 years now. Why not apply some of those capabilities straight onto the Ethernet layer? So one just example of that here is that you've got a number of PBBTE devices here with a, a database of connections, and you want to set up a, a connection request. So this typically goes down and has a setup. Can I have a connection, please? This says, yes, you can. Can I get to the far end node? This says, yes, you can. Once you get there, you then signal backwards and say, OK, I'll set up that connection. In SDH, that's setting up a cross-connect at each one of these points that says, OK, from port X to port Y. What you're really doing on the way back here is you're updating the forwarding tables and giving you that end-to-end -end Ethernet circuit. So we think it's a really good candidate for extending the control plane technology towards. So in summary, um, dynamic light paths are very much achievable using control plane networks. Yes, you can do them with MPLS. But at the transport level, you can really get deterministic guaranteed bandwidth. Um, circuit switch networks give very good performance, as I've indicated through the uh, USN data. And there's good interoperation already today, trialed and tested with ASON on GMPLS. And we think some of the future directions for that are applying it to OTN and applying it down to some of these connection-oriented Ethernet uh, focused networks. And we think GASON and GMPLS that we're using today are good candidates for those. Thank you. Questions, please. I can hear you. Uh, does OTN reach the 100 gig? Has that been specified uh, that people are working on 100 gigabit Ethernet? That was 100 gig, did you say? Yeah, 100 gigabit Ethernet. People are working on that. How does OTN? Uh, you talked about you know till 40. I just yeah. wanted to know. That, that's a very interesting one. I'm not sure if you've been involved in any of the uh, IEEE uh, high-speed study groups. I think from a colleague from Nortel at the back there, I think asking the question. Um, there's a big debate right now. Um, if you look at 40 gig, is you know, OTU3. That's pretty well documented. Give or take some. Uh, well, it is. It's fully standardised. What they're looking at now is do what do we make OTU4? And the, the data rate, and you mentioned there, is it 111, is it 120? That's still a big um, matter of debate. The latest I've seen is they're trying to get it work for both um, three lots of ODU3 and big enough to do 100 gig E as well. So the payload is, is going to be designed to wrap both of those together. So th three ODU3s as well as 100 gigabit Ethernet natively. Um, but it's, it's a heated debate, I understand, from the sessions that my colleagues have been to. Yeah, that, that's where we are. So it, it is, is, should be ratified pretty soon, but I know the debates are very heated about making sure it does the right thing for both Ethernet and for SDH even, and for the OTN domain. O 
Protean seems much better than SDH Sonnet. I'm not very familiar with it. Can you run it across the Atlantic? You actually can't on the, on the previous generation. Uh, as you're probably aware, the, sort of the transatlantic links are the repeaters, and they repeat at STM64 because they use the FEC. There's pretty enhanced FEC uh, utilized for submarine links. So really, they've pinched some of the G709 FEC standard payload and used it with a very enhanced submarine special kind of payload situation. What I will say, I'm reliably informed by, I mean, Sienna doesn't make submarine systems, that the next generation of submarine links are going in that are OTN capable. So you'll see OTU2 links across the, the transatlantic as opposed to STM64 or OC192. Say again? When, when would I expect it to happen? I don't, they are being built out now, as I understand. If you, if you went and bought a submarine manufacturer's equipment today, it will say it can support it straight off the bat. It's all, and you're probably aware these are very costly projects. And they're, yeah, uh, there are, I'm aware of, there's two or three consortia getting back together again to do overlays and capacity ads, which are new cable ads, essentially. Um, I know they're certainly doing the Asia part of the world, probably up and around India, um, but I think there's also some transatlantic links happening also. But I, I can certainly find out. Yes. Okay. Well, I stand corrected. They can do it today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Next and last talk is about optical burst and packet switching. Originally, it was supposed to be held by Michael Mahoney from Essex, but unfortunately, he was unavailable to, unavailable to come. And we are very, very lucky to have Lars Dittmann from DTU, from this university, to step in and have a talk on the same topic. But I have to stress, it's not the same talk, but it's the same topic. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Yes, um, I stepped in in the last minute to replace Mike. Uh, I've kept the, um, the title of the talk. Uh, I added a subtitle, <laughs> um, the long-term goal for optics, uh, optical networking, and uh, put also a question mark there. Um, I will not be so specifically about optical burst and packet switching, but more generally about optical networking. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about uh, more about how, how these things are integrated, what's actually needed, because optical burst and packet switching, there are many things that are still lacking there. Uh, there's a lot of technological challenges, but there's also a lot of discussion about where, whether we really have the need for this, because it, it really re, uh, depends on the kind of networking that we like to do, whether we're going for very flat networks or we would like to have more hierarchical networks. Um, and then finally, also, I think a, a thing that is often missing when we are working on these things is that we're very focused on the technology and the components and we are often missing the integration, the administration of these things. So I'll, I'll do some talks about optical burst and, and packet switching, but I'll also, also do a lot more and more general things about optical networking. Furthermore, I've decided to split the, uh, the talk into two parts. One thing is, is more general uh, talk on optical networking, um, both in short and long term perspectives. And then finally, I'll also uh, say a little bit more about optical switching from a very academic perspective. Um, some uh, results or some uh, thoughts from a European research project called eFoton1. Uh, it's so that um, in these areas, I know that the, for optical burst switching, there are uh, commercial products being announced. But at least for optical packet switching, more and more companies have lost their interest. And it's mainly within the academia that the, um, the, the, the research is going on for optical packet switching. So these are the two uh, areas that I'll address. Um, when I was asked to talk about optical networking, uh, I often have the, the problem that people are often confused about optical networking and confuse that with optical transmission. 
And there's a good reason for that, because also when SDH Sunnis was first announced, it was called the first generation of optical networking. In my terminology, that's not real optical networking, because there's no component that is doing any networking activity or any networking function in the optical domain. In SDH Sunnit, it was plain the use of optics for transmission. And it was the first time that the optical transmission was standardized, and that was a very good thing. But then again, it was not, in my respect, real optical networking. For me, optical networking should contain some kind of elements where the signal can be switched or routed into different directions uh, and, and based on some uh, administration, some control system, some management system, or whatever. Um, so that, in my terminology, is real optical network. And, and we're still starting to see some first attempts with the light path. But when we're going to time domain with, with, with packet switching and burst switching, it's still very limited. And one of the reasons why it's limited what we can do in optical networking is that an, an optical network is fundamentally analog. We do not have the same device as we have still not in commercial and operational network as we have in the electronic domain that we just sample the device. We can do a lot of, of, of uh, processing on the device, on the, on, the, on the signal, because we maintain that in the analog domain. When we're amplifying, we try to reshape the original signal as it was originally sent. We're not, we cannot just sample it and create a new signal based on our samples, at least, again, not in commercial networks. There are some uh, results from, uh, from research labs that can do that. So that also means that optical networks are still very simple. Um, I was running a, a, um, a research project, uh, a European research project, some years ago uh, called David on optical packet switching. And then again, when we talked about optical packets, a lot of people thought that they were similar to the packet we have in the IP domain. And when we had an, an optical packet route, so people believed that we could do the same functionalities as we could do in the, in the electronic domain. But an optical packet and what we can do in the optical domain is still very simple compared to what we can do in the electronic domains in the higher layers. Um, I'll touch a little bit again on, on, uh, on what was uh, mentioned in the previous uh, talk in, in, in about what I will call more the, the current trends in transport network. Again, because I think what a lot of people talk about when they're talking about optical networks and optical networks are transport networks. And uh, there are already, as mentioned in the previous talks, a number of competitors. Um, and maybe I'm insulting somebody with this slide. Uh, but at least I see uh, these uh, approaches. Uh, one approach is just to keep the uh, SDH Sunnet network. I know that people pr have predicted the, the Sunnet SDH network to be dead for many years. Um, there were predictions about eight years, five years, 15 years. Actually, there are also some, um, some who really like the, the, uh, the, the circuit switch uh, environment because it's very simple and very predictable and very stable. And uh, sometimes you don't discover that until you remove that. And then you suddenly see that you are losing a lot of functionalities. And that are some of the functionalities that people are now trying to push into the Ethernet. Um, so we have the two competitors, as we saw before, the, um, the PBT, uh, which is basically based on the Mac and Mac approach. Um, it's highly driven by, by Nortel and, the, and, the, and BT, who's been very interested in this. It's again, it's a circuit-oriented packet switching. It's making Ethernet circuit-oriented. Uh, but it's not just circuit-oriented, it's also a lot about monitoring the performance of the network, which is not uh, available in standard Ethernet. And we have the, the TMPLS. Again, it's driven by another competitor, the Alcatel-Lucent. It was, I think, originally proposed by Telabs, a smaller manufacturer in, in the US. But now it's really Alcatel-Lucent who's driving it. There are also a lot of people in the IHF who uh, don't believe that we should have any of this, but uh, we could, should still use Ethernet as a kind of transport network but then we should uh, introduce some kind of routing functionalities into the Ethernet, but forget everything about the circuit uh, emulation, the circuit-oriented uh, administration. And then we, of course, also have the, the people who are working completely in the IP layer who said, no, we don't need all this. We can do everything in the IP layer. We can do all kind of restoration, all kind of management, all kind of performance monitoring in the IP uh, uh, network layer. And that is, of course, uh, driven by companies like Cisco and Juniper who says, Forget about TMPLS, PBT, or whatever you call it. Uh, we don't need that. We just need a simple transmission system underneath our uh, IP layer. So again, this is also reflecting whether we would like to have a flat IP nether, uh, uh, network or whether we believe that we should have some kind of hierarchy in the network with a transport network that provides some kind of high reliability, high predictability, 
Um, maybe circuit switch, maybe with some slow, slow, uh, slow dynamics in the, in the packet domain, but at least uh, some kind of infrastructure underneath the, uh, the service network, which will then be the, be the IP layer. So um, if we look at the, um, the different trends in the, in the optical networking, we can say that the, the WDM uh, was the first approach uh, in making um, uh, availability of, of, uh, of, of wavelengths in the network. Um, it was a big breakthrough that we could have more than a single uh, wavelength. And uh, I've seen so many papers on how many wavelengths you can put on a single fiber. Uh, if you ask the operators how many wavelengths they're actually using, it's not these uh, several hundred wavelengths. Uh, at least a lot of people are not, uh, even not using the dense WDM approach. They are more using the coarse WDM approach because it's simpler. Um, also, a lot of people um, said that the WDM was very successful because we had the, the, the EDFA. Uh, again, I've seen more and more operators tend to move away from the optical amplifier because if we just have a few wavelengths, it's simpler just to convert into electronic domain and using electronic amplifiers because of that will also provide a number of features for monitoring the signal and maybe also manipulate the signals. Um, if we look at the trends we saw in, in the optical networking, then a, a, a natural follow-up to circuit switching in, in WDM domain was to enable some kind of multiplexing in the uh, time domain. And of course, that uh, when everything was moving in the service layers in the internet into packet-oriented mode, it was obvious that we should try to see whether we could also include that into the uh, optical layer. So have some kind of time domain operation in the, uh, in the, um, in the uh, uh, optical layer, either burst or packets or cells or whatever. And then, of course, also to see that whether we could uh, completely uh, replace the, uh, the functionalities of, of all other transfer networks by a, an optical infrastructure. So we could have a, an IP layer and then support it completely by a uh, underlying uh, optical infrastructure. So if we look in the, in, in the time trends, then we could say that initially we have the long-term wavelength assignments. We started to have more fast wavelength assignments. Fast could be many things, um, hours, days, maybe minutes, or seconds. And then we go, when we go into seconds or sub-seconds, we can say that we're starting to have this burst switching. Uh, so what is the boundary between burst switching and very fast wavelength switching? It's something that's been analyzed a lot. And of course, burst switching, the longer we have the burst, the more, the more efficient uh, the system will be, because then they tend to be similar to circuit switching. Uh, and then, of course, if we need more and more dynamics, we can move into packet or cell switching. Cell, again, maybe people with um, uh, have been uh, involved in, in ATM networks will say, Ooh, don't mention that. Um, but cell is mainly just, for me, a, a packet of a fixed size. And uh, if you look at many of the approaches for optical packet switching is that in order to implement these optical packet switching, then using a fixed size packet is, is uh, very often uh, appropriate. Um, so the trends have been for many years to do more and more dynamics into the optical domain. And of course, you, can, you might say, is that just because that everything is becoming packet or, uh, packetized or packet-oriented, that we need this, this trend. Um, some of the, um, the key problems we have in optical networks is, of course, that we have a lot of technolog technological problems. Um, many of the devices have been demonstrated in the laboratory, but when we try to move them into um, to, uh, commercial networks, uh, first of all, they're not always as stable as reported in papers. Um, secondly, the administration of these devices is very delicate. Um, and if you want to run a network where you need to have an, an, a person very close to all the equipment so you can fine tune it uh, continuously, it's not uh, appropriate for commercial use. Um, other things like the optical 3R regenerator has been demonstrated many, many years ago, but we still haven't seen it in, in operational networks. Um, and some of these things uh, will be uh, tr the, the, the natural transition into, to, uh, transition into uh, a digital uh, optical networking domain, which is actually needed in order to have a, a, a more uh, well-performing uh, optical infrastructure. Then we have all the administrative uh, uh, problems. Um, and later on in this talk, I'll say a little bit more about these uh, administrative uh, problems, because in order to accept these, we need to have them integrated. Uh, and uh, one of the current trends, of course, in, in having the integration of the lower layers with the higher layers is the GMPLS approach. Uh, and I'll just um, 
uh, illustrate a way that we can actually integrate the optical burst, switching into the um, uh, GMPLS approach. Um, of course, with some modification of the, uh, some of the uh, GMPLS uh, protocols, for instance, the RSVP protocol, but also for the optical packet switching. However, it's important to stress, again, that the optical network will never be a replacement of the service layer. The optical network is something that remains in the transport network. And the only, re or the only way that optical networking makes sense is, is if we accept to have a hierarchical network with a transport network that is supporting a service network with a certain degree of uh, reliability, a certain degree of predictability and, and uh, a high degree of availability. So some of the, the trends in this uh, about uh, integration of the administration has to do with the way that networking have been traditionally built. This is the traditional way that we have the, the service network on top, which is mainly administrated by control, and the transport network in the bottom that was mainly administrated by a management system, meaning that the dynamics was quite, uh, quite low. So this is the, the classical split of these two uh, ways of administrating a network. If we look at the way that uh, the administration have uh, evolved during the, uh, the last few years, at least the interest in administration, then we can say that the classical split of having a, a uh, automatic control system and a manual management system in the bottom is being integrated. And the reason for that is, of course, that we can have a much better dynamics and much better utilization of the resources. So this is one of the, the trends we see in the, in the administration of networks, is that we can no longer split saying that we have control in the top and management in the bottom. We'll have the, uh, the same kind of functionalities in both areas so that we can have some dynamic resource administration all through the network. And of course, that is the idea of the, the GMPLS, but also the idea of the, uh, the other solution, the, um, the, the ASIN approach. But there's a clear difference, again, in the way that they are, they are integrated. Because in GMPLS, you are integrating everything in one common integrated loop, whereas in the more segmented system, you have a lower loop administrating the transport network and a higher loop administrating the higher uh, the packet uh, based service network and then you have some integration between them some some messaging between the two different uh, infrastructures and then again this two different approaches that is splitting the um, the uh, community in the way that a network should be operated um, I just brought a, an example of how um, we have uh, made a proposal and actually made some some simulation of how to to integrate uh, optical burst switching into the GMPLS environment because I believe that it's not, ne not just a matter of developing the technology. If we cannot integrate into all the other parts of the network, then it, it doesn't make sense. And uh, we actually did some, some experiments. Uh, we needed to modify, make some modification to the RSVP protocol uh, because basically optical burst switching is not about reserving uh, capacity. Optical burst switching about when we have a burst, we just send it and hope for the resources, and we send some, some control packets in front of the, of the burst that should try to reserve a wavelength on its path to the, uh, to the receiver. So fundamentally, optical burst switching doesn't fit with an approach where we, are, uh, um, where we need to reserve resources. But still, we can do that because we can reserve the path but not necessarily reserve the, the resources. So this is an, an, an approach showing how we can, we can integrate um, this into the uh, environment. So um, a few comments to these first uh, remarks about the, uh, the optical um, networking is that um, we can say that uh, despite that we have, um, uh, it's said that we have unlimited resources, uh, there are more and more trends in trying to utilize these resources more and more heavily. Um, so we often talked about this uh, huge um, backbone infrastructure with so many uh, capacities on all the fibers and, and so on. And we, can all, we also heard earlier today that uh, there is a need for going for higher and higher bit rates. Um, so the idea here is that despite that we have more and more resources, we have a lot of activities trying to utilize these resources in a much better way. And both optical burst switching and optical packet, packet switching is trying to have a, a better granularity in these uh, optical infrastructures so that we can have a higher utilization in general. Um, the control systems being developed is also trying to have more direct access to it. So we don't need to send a fax or anything to have a reconfiguration of the optical layer. If there's a need in the service layer, if sudden 
changes in traffic pattern uh, demands it, we can also have some reconfiguration in the, in the optical layer. Of course, that can also have an impact on the availability and the reliability of the transport network, but that's another issue that I will not address here. But then a final comment, of course, could be that why do we try to do so much about optimizing the resources when we can see that we have all these fibers and, and more and more fibers, four more cables is actually having several fibers and we can put more and more wavelength on the, on the, on the, on the individual uh, fibers. So basically we could, instead of doing all this, we could just try to post more and more uh, resources into the, into the network. Of course there will be, be areas in the network where we do not have this, uh, but my belief is that we could have a more um, uh, highly a mesh infrastructure that could provide the same uh, capacity rather than just optimizing and optimizing in the, in the infrastructure. At least I think there's some, some, um, some thing that doesn't really fit together in this. Okay, this was the first part of my talk. Um, the second one is not as large as the first one, uh, but I would like to uh, address here in this uh, forum some activities that is going on in the uh, project called eFoton1, uh, which is actually a, um, a European research project that is focusing on optical networking. Uh, and within that, which is structured um, very much like a European spread university, we have some virtual departments, and one of them where we are co-sharing uh, the activities is on optical switching systems. And I've brought here some of the, uh, some of the uh, results from this project about what is actually the, some of the, the key issues identified by this uh, consortium about what is the, uh, the problems that we need to tackle in uh, addressing optical networking or optically based transport network in the future. And I've brought this uh, list here just to, to show you that there are many different problems that we need to solve in order to go for more uh, higher degree of, of uh, optical uh, use in the, in the transport network. I brought two uh, specific examples of activities and the first one is, is a, um, is a uh, activity uh, that comes also from uh, some collaboration where we are in, involved, uh, which is um, signal protection extension for uh, converter saving wavelength assignment in GMPLS optical networks. And uh, one of the idea here is that um, um, wavelength provision or, or light wave provision is quite nice, uh, but often we are in the need of, uh, because of, of uh, contention in the in the uh, uh, Lambda routers, we are in need of uh, wavelength converters. And the wavelength converters are quite expensive. So if we can limit the number of wavelength converters in our network, um, that could limit the cost of these networks. Um, and with the, DM, with the current uh, GMPLS approach for uh, wavelength pass assignments, there's no way of trying to minimize the, uh, the number of uh, wavelength converters in the network. So what we've done is to uh, redevelop or improve the, uh, some of the signaling approach for the GMPLS uh, administration of a, of, a, of a wavelength network by m trying to minimize the, the number of wavelength converters in the network. So we, don't re we can just have a pool of wavelength converters in each network node. Um, so what we're trying to do is, I'll just speed up here, is trying to uh, find a way that we can notify the following uh, wavelength routers in the path about whether we need a wavelength converter or not. So normally we just propagate a label set from source A to node B. So we have a step-by-step -step routing approach. Uh, and we notify the uh, node B that we are able to use lambda 1, 2, and 4 in this segment of the, of the connection. Then we notify the next one that we can use on this path, 1, 3, and 4. And then finally, we, we notify the final one that we can use one and three. But these are locally information. The node D doesn't know about wh where we have uh, wavelength uh, reservations in the, in the earlier nodes. So if we try to set up a connection, we'll do that first. We could either do that first by reserving lambda one in all three parts, and then we didn't need any kind of wavelength converters. But we could also have the situation where no, uh, destination D would select wavelength number three. Again, that would be possible to reuse in the, in the, in the next segment. But then we end up in the a, in a, in a connection between A and B where uh, wavelength number three is already allocated. And if we try to set up that connection, then we need a wavelength converter in the uh, node B. 
And that could have been avoided if we had selected the uh, wavelength number one instead. So the approach in this uh, um, research have been to notify uh, the, the following notes in a way that they can try to minimize and try to select the, the, uh, the connection using wavelength number one instead of wavelength number three so we can avoid the, uh, the, wa the, um, the wavelength conversion. Um, so instead of just notifying the, the following note with a label set, we also notify it with a suggested vector which is containing information about how many wavelength routers are needed on the path if we're selecting that specific uh, wavelength. So we, we can see on the first part, we can select both one, two, and four without having any kind of wavelength converters. If we then go on with these, we can say that if we want to use one, three, and four on the next one, we have for selecting wavelength number three the need of one wavelength converters. And we can then propagate that information to the final uh, node in the, in the network. Um, so now destination D will know in the previous uh, solution with just a label set, it could choose either one or three randomly. Uh, but now it knows that despite that both one and three is available, choosing wavelength number three would affect the need of a wavelength converter in follow the, one of the following notes. So this mechanism, this approach is trying to actually enhance some of the administrative things in a optical routed network um, for minimizing the, the number of uh, wavelength uh, converters. I'll also um, highlight another activity to illustrate some of the activities going on in this project uh, about the optical flip-flop, which is based on urban <coughs> etabium, doped fiber, uh, which is um, another key element in making uh, the optical environment uh, digital, uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the applications for such a, uh, an optical flip-flop would be to uh, either to uh, erase a packet in case there are packet contention, con contention in an optical node, but it could also be to open a, uh, a, um, uh, a switch, uh, a controlling a switch in, in this. So this is a, another uh, activity based on actually implementation and with some experimental results uh, on measuring these uh, components. If you are interested in, in some of this, you can go to the uh, eFilton1 homepage. There will be a, uh, a number of links to, um, to uh, results from this. So, but having covered these two areas, I would like to thank you and say if you have any questions or comments to what I've presented to you. These questions, the buses will wait. <laughs> well, I have one question myself. Okay. It's a minor question about uh, implementation of these optical switches. If you have burst switching, this must be very fast. So this MEMS approach will not work. How is it done then? It's, it actually works, it can still work with the MEMS approach because it depends on how big you are implementing the, uh, um, the bursts. So if you have a longer burst, you can do that. But also, uh, what we did, for instance, in the uh, David uh, approach, we used uh, semiconductor optical amplifiers, which could have a switching time down to a few nanoseconds. So that can even work for, for, for packet switching as well. So there are different ways of, of implementing uh, solutions. But still, MEMS could also be used for burst switching if we just have very long bursts uh, um, aggregated. The usual delays are 10, 20 milliseconds, so yeah, something like this. Could, could still do, yeah. So okay. mo many of the uh, burst switching approaches is just sub-second bursts. Uh, 10 millisecond, 100 millisecond uh, bursts could, could do this. Of course, you will uh, waste some capacity because you have to wait for the, yeah. for the MEMS to, yeah. to, uh, to reconfigure. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Everybody tired? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> then, next thing is evaluation forms, please, and then the sausages or the buses. Goodbye, everybody.